Thank you, Dr. Olchin. Thank you, Art, for the invitation to be here. It's always nice coming up to Sierra. Um, Roger mentioned the uh, field day or the CBCIA tour. Somebody mentioned that at Bridgeport, and that's Sorry. a picture from yeah. Bridgeport. Yeah, we need to hide it. All right. So this is Bridgeport. If you go on the CBCIA tour, this is kind of the landscape that you'll see. So let's see, Roger talked about killing animals. Allison talked about um, DNA testing them. What we want to focus on is getting them on the ground. You can't sell anything, you can't DNA test it unless you produce them. Um, some interesting figures I saw from a recent study from National Animal Health Monitoring System. They do surveys every few years on different uh, commodities. And they found that only about 20 to 25 percent of beef producers nationwide semen test their bulls. So I think we have a long way to go before we can really implement DNA testing if we can't even get people to semen test. So um, with that, we'll get started uh, talking about the beef industry. You know this as well as I do. It's not an individual industry. It's not a single in entity. It's not vertically integrated. There's a huge amount of diversity in management, the environments that cattle exist in, the intensification and so on and so on. So what I tell you here today may work very well here at Sierra Field Station, but it may not be the perfect um, system for what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I need to emphasize that every plan needs to be specific for the individual um, involved. So while this is a general uh, overview, you need to take it home and deal with your own veterinarian to figure out what works best in your particular system. Oh dear. So, what I base a lot of this talk on is from um, Extension Veterinarian based out of Florida. It's called Constructing Diagrams to Represent the Management System of a Beef Herd. Um, we're fairly fortunate in that we have some specific objectives that we need to meet. First of all, we need to get them bred, then we need to keep them pregnant, then don't let the babies die, and finally we want to make them grow big and tasty. So, I mean, really, that's the four essentials when you talk about um, beef herd health. Uh, it's not too complicated, but getting to meet those goals can be a bit more uh, of a challenge. With beef cattle, you can talk about some of these particular goals. 90% of or more of all cows give birth to a live calf. We can attain that by maximizing pregnancy rates through nutrition, disease, using bulls, that sort of thing. Increase the percent of cows that wean a live calf, so we need to keep them healthy after they're born, prevent neonatal mortality, that sort of thing. Increase calf weaning weight through crossbreeding, nutrition, parasite control, and finally increase the longevity of a breeding herd. Uh, a lot of studies have shown that they get maximum profitability at about eight cows per cow. So that's, that's a goal that we should also be keeping in mind. We want to keep those cows around because it's cheaper to keep her in the herd than to build a new replacement. So with beef cattle, it's reasonably simple. Everything happens once a year, right? We breed them once a year. We wean calves once a year. So we can do things on an annual cycle. And all the events are interrelated. What we do... When we decide to breed them, we'll have an impact on when they calve, which will have an impact on when we wean them, and that sort of thing. So we need all the events are interrelated. So we can use a cycle diagram to evaluate an individual operation and plan our future practices. And then we can use what you're already doing to fit in our herd health program to try and make it work for you. So we want to keep it simple, right? <clears throat> know what the disease challenges are that you're faced with. Know when they occur then either raise the resistance or reduce the challenge that each of those diseases present to you. So Dr. Ritchie pre presents it as these cycles. So here's our cow-calf cycle here. Cows get bred, um, or sorry, cows calve, they get bred, they wean the calf, and it happens again the next year. It, when they wean the calves, the ca some calves go off here, some get sold as stalkers or feeders, some stay in the herd as replacement heifers, and then they get bred, they have calves, and then they become, go back, flow into the cow cycle. And here's the bull cycle. It's a, another separate uh, cycle. So we can look at each of these cycles individually and figure out when we should be vaccinating, what we should be vaccinating against, and go from there. So here's cow cycle. Let's say 
I want to calve on January 1st. I'm going to calve for 60 days. So then my calving season is going to end the 2nd of March. <clears throat> if I know that, so I start there, then I know that I'm going to have to breed, turn the bulls in March 22nd, pull them out May 21st. It just goes together. You can't, do, you can't have calves unless you get them bred. And so these two parts uh, work together. Given that, uh, you know, we might decide to wean our calves on the 15th of August and then those stalkers and feeders and replacement heifers disappear. And then we're back to the start again. So based on this, we can figure out, well, when do we have opportunities to work with those cows and calves, right? It's not, you can't just bring them in when the vet tells you, I want to vaccinate on the 10th of May, bring, the, bring them in for me. Um, we can figure out when are ideal opportunities to work with people. So obviously we could have an opportunity to work with cows and calves here pre-calving. If we have some issues at calving season, maybe you've got a scour problem, we could bring the cows in then and do a pre-calving scours vaccination, for example. Pre-breeding, this is a pretty common time. So before the cows go out to get bred, well, we're going to vaccinate them against reproductive diseases. We're going to test the bulls for trick and that sort of thing. So that's an obvious time when we should be doing that. We might have a branding season here in the middle of breeding. Um, we can bring the calves in for pre-weaning shots. Uh, we might have them around, keep them around, and do some post-weaning shots later on. So if you work on this kind of a cycle, you can see when your ideal opportunities might exist for working the animals. So that makes it easy for us to think about, well, what happens if we miss that 60-day uh, breeding season? Instead, we've got... 120, 150 day breeding season, well what happens then? So here's our 150 day breeding season. That means that cows are calving for much longer. They're calving for 150 days as well. So when do you do the pre-breeding shot then? Because these two are going to overlap. So if we do our pre-breeding shot after everybody's calved, then we're in the midst of breeding season already, right? So we're not really pre-breeding. If we do our pre-breeding shot here before breeding season, then not everybody's calved yet. And so some of those cows aren't getting the right vaccinations and they won't respond and all those sorts of things. So using this kind of cycle diagram makes it easier to demonstrate why we recommend what we recommend. And uh, it makes it, I think, easier to understand in many ways. So I use this to... Uh, talk to vet students quite a bit. <clears throat> you know, it's disease is a balance between resistance and challenge. So if we can keep our resistance level above the challenge, then everything should work out good. <clears throat> what happens if we decrease resistance? Well, we can have decreased resistance if we have stress. Say we've got poor nutrition, we ship the calves off to the feedlot. It's a hot day, there's heat stress, we bring the calves in for processing, branding, castration, and so on. So the resistance drops, yet the disease challenge remains the same, so we might see disease symptoms. Or we could have increased disease challenge, so maybe we bring a diseased animal into a susceptible herd, or we, a susceptible animal is added to a diseased herd. So again, this balance between resistance and disease gets off kilter, and we might see disease symptoms. So the goals of the herd health program, in general, are uh, fairly straightforward. We want to increase resistance and decrease challenge. So we can increase resistance through some of the vaccination programs. And uh, the proceedings has the current vaccination program that we have here at the center. And we can reduce challenge through appropriate parasite control, making sure we have biosecurity plans. We're testing animals as they come in for whatever diseases we're concerned about. We remove carriers so we might test for BVD, persistent infected animals, and take them out of the herd. And we can treat the infected animals as well. So again, if you break it down into these simple kinds of concepts, it makes it more straightforward to understand, I believe. So we want to stop disease spread from an infected animal to susceptible animals. We can do that by removing this infected animal by either uh, killing it or treating it. We can reduce transmission either by isolating animals, so we could have uh, isolation ward for sick animals, and we can increase resistance, either inherent or acquired. 
So vaccination 101, why do we vaccinate? To increase resistance. When's the best time to vaccinate? Before the uh, disease challenge. So the example I use here is E. coli. Say you've got E. coli scours in your newborn calves. You'll have the recommendation to vaccinate six weeks or four weeks before calving, right? So this is why we do that. We vaccinate here, we get maximum resistance here. And this is when we see the challenge, is after those calves are born, they hit land in that manure-laden environment. So you want to have the maximum protection there. Resistance doesn't last forever, so after a while it tends to decrease. Um, hopefully the disease challenge will decrease, all the calves are born. Weather dries up, everything's good, and so we don't have as much challenge. So again, we'll vaccinate again before we see this increase in the disease challenge. <laughs> so again, let's take that E. coli example. Say you've got a prolonged calving season. Now instead of calving over 60 days, you're calving over 210 days. If we vaccinate all the cows at the same time here, we get our maximum resistance there, and it gradually fades and disappears. Yet we maintain that challenge for a longer period of time, and so we get this imbalance between uh, challenge and resistance, and we have the opportunity for disease to present itself. <clears throat> Similarly, if we vaccinate three months before calving instead of six weeks or four weeks, this is what you might see. So we get our good resistance, but we don't see the disease challenge until that resistance is starting to decrease. And so again, we have the opportunity for disease to present itself. <clears throat> so again, back to Dr. Ritchie's protocol, he just divides disease challenges into these four areas. Uh, there's diseases that affect survival and development of the animal. There's diseases that affect reproduction and fetal development. Uh, diseases that we need to provide adequate colostrum for, so we can protect the newborn calf. And then there's disease barrier for the herd, diseases that we want to keep out of the area such as yonis, that sort of thing. This is the list that he provides, and again, you'll have to look at your individual operation to know which diseases are important where you are. Um, you know, you may not be in an area with anaplasma. Uh, here at Sierra, we are, and so we include anaplasma in our vaccination schedule. So they break them down into these different categories. <coughs> um, and then if you go to your uh, your cow-calf cycle, you can see when those diseases are of more importance to the cow herd. So here, calving season is obviously when, you wanna, when you're most worried about protection of the newborn calf. And so you want to have good protection against these types of diseases when the calves hit the ground. Similarly, breeding season, we're most worried about reproductive diseases. And so that's why the recommendation is to use these pre-breeding shots against things like IBR, lepto, uh, that sort of thing. And so if you break it down here, you can see when these diseases are most important and when you need to have maximum protection. So you'd want to protect calves by uh, boosting your pre-calving vaccinations, for example. <clears throat> You can do the same thing for breeding bulls. You can go through their cycle and, and look at what diseases are most important uh, for survival and development, for production and reproduction, for disease barrier to the herd. And again, you can look at the uh, cycle of the bull and you'll know when to focus on those various conditions uh, and when you need to protect against those issues uh, that will be presenting themselves. <clears throat> Economics of beef production, again, Roger talked about niche marketing and how you can gain value through niche marketing. Um, so carcass quality, if let's say that's, we'll give that a value of one in the overall scale of commercial cow-calf production. Rate of gain would be twice as important as carcass quality. So if you get a choice, that's good. If you get a prime, that's obviously much better. But it's more important that they're gaining weight to get there. But really, what's far more important is fertility. If we can't get a calf on the ground, obviously, you know, we've got nothing to sell. It doesn't matter what the carcass is if we don't have a carcass to sell. So we really focus on fertility in our herd health programs. <clears throat> and our goal is to have high pregnancy rates within a short breeding season. 
And I just try to illustrate that with this graph. Let's say you know, you're talking to your buddies down at the coffee shop and you all say, I, you know, we had 95% pregnant this year and, and you're all very proud of that and that's good. 95%, that's a good thing to aim for. But here's three different herds, each have 95% of their cows pregnant. But this uh, group got 60% bred within the first 20 days, another 25% in the next 21 days, and the final 10% in the final 21 days. So a 63 day breeding cycle for this herd compared to these other two herds that again they wound up with 95% pregnant but it took them much longer to get there and they didn't quite get that same number bred the first uh, cycle. So let's put some numbers there. <coughs> let's see these, say these calves gain two pounds per day for example and we wean them we wean them all on the same day, right? Come September 15th, it's the day to wean them. doesn't matter if they're born two weeks ago or six and a half months ago. They get weaned on September 15th. So calves born in that first period are going to weigh more. So let's say the average weight at <coughs> weaning is 500 pounds. It's not a very good herd. They haven't done EPD testing. So only 500 pound weaning weight. So those that were born in the second 21 day cycle are going to weigh less and we'll put them at 458 pounds and so on. <clears throat> so herd A is going to have a total of 45,000 pounds of calf to sell, 100, pound, 100 cow herd. Herd B 39,000, herd C 38,000. So just by having a short calving season, herd A has over 5,000 pounds more, 6,000 pounds more of calf to sell come September 15th when they sell calves. And you, you can do the math better than I at $1.20 or $1.40 a pound, whatever those five weights are selling for, that adds up to a lot of money. You can easily buy an EPD tested bull for that extra five or six thousand bucks you're going to get by selling those calves. So this is why we harp on the short breeding season um, <clears throat> and how important it is to get those cows bred early. So I guess that was a pretty quick run through. Um, Dr. Moss is going to continue with uh, further uh, discussion on, on vaccination programs, but if the, anybody has any questions, Let's I'd be happy questions to... At the end. Questions at the end? Don't, don't, don't forget your questions. Okay, Dr. Moss? Now we're going to talk a little bit about what they vaccinate for at airfields. So you talked about anaplas, uh, which is unique to, to, uh, to this ranch foothill areas and stuff like that. If you're down the valley, you don't have to worry about it. If you're further up in the mountains, you don't have to worry about it, except when you bring cattle in. And what else do you vaccinate for? Oh, we do the clostridial diseases uh, for cows and calves, clostridial diseases, black leg, that sort of thing. They, they'll get a dose of branding, and again, pre-weaning, and then when they go down to the feedlot at uh, UC Davis, they'll get another dose of uh, clostridial vaccines. Cow herd gets uh, the re uh, reproductive disease vaccines, the IBR, PI3, Campylobacter, Leptospira. Pre-breeding, we use a modified live virus vaccine for that, and so we do that before the cows go with the bulls. Um, not everybody can do that. We recognize that modified live vaccines don't work for everybody, but here we're able to do that, and we believe that that's the approach here. Calves also get the respiratory vaccines, the IBR, PA3, BRSV, um, and one shot. I believe they get that here before they're, vac before they're weaned. Um, let's see, what am I missing? It's a, you, you summarized it in here too. And, so. and, it's, and it's in the book. Now, now, how many of you think that you should just adopt the Sierra Field Station vaccination program. How many of you think you should do that? Sounds sound like a good program. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, why wouldn't you adopt it? Not enough don't? Every herd's different. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to get at, was every herd's going to be different, and you need to work that vaccine program out so it works for you. Doesn't matter what the neighbor's doing, etc. So I think that's really a good point. So I wanted to make that point before I before I started on, on my stuff. Thank, thank, thank you very much. What, what, are the, what are the four really important things you gotta do in a cow-calf herd? And then Dr. Hoare has really talked about this. 
Allison talked a little bit about some of it. We'll talk about more. What are the four things you got to do? Cow calf herd. What do you have to do? Keep the cow alive. That's important. Okay, got to keep the cow alive. Then what do you got to do? You got to get her bread unless she's a pet. You know, got to get her bread. Then what do you have to do? What's the next thing? Got to have a live calf. You can. It's hard to raise a dead one. So you got to have a live calf, and then you got to raise that calf. That's what you got to do. Those are the four things. And I think as long as you keep Dr. Hoare's cycle in mind, the fact that each ranch is different, and raising a calf, those are really important things to do. So what I'm going to talk about is some other considerations about vaccines. So um, let's let's go to the next slide, and and we'll talk a little bit about these vaccines. Oh, this will work too. I, 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 I'm one of these guys who can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, and and part of this has to do with the Deep Quality Assurance Program, and it's been around a long time. I uh, hope this doesn't disappear. No, it did. Um, we we've gone through about 6,000 California producers. Uh, it's a three, three year certification program, and CCA kind of runs it. Dr. Olchin and I work for CCA, or we work for CCA in some respects. Uh, and so it's a recertification deal, and Stevie Ipson down there can help you out on that. It's about building quality in versus worrying about inspecting thing every, everything at the end. So it's kind of a uh, total quality management type of a, of a program that we talk about. It's prevention of disease. So we don't have to treat them with drugs. Uh, it's vaccination is, is an important part. And for vaccination, it's not just buying the vaccine. It's not just putting the vaccine in the animal. It's making sure that when you do that, the animal's immune response is ready to go and, and will help out. So there's a number of steps, and we'll, we'll talk, talk about those a little bit. So you've got to have the, the best vaccine. And, and Dr. Will talked about vaccines we use here. They're in your proceedings. You need, to, you need to use those vaccines. Some vaccines are better than others. There are brands that are better than others, and your veterinarian can help you with that. Yeah, they're all certified through USDA, but for your operation and the challenge you have, there are some vaccines that are going to be better, some vaccines are going to be worse. Work with your veterinarian to make sure that's worse. And, and some, sometimes the route of administration, intranasal versus subcutaneous injection, can make a big difference. And once again, the animal's immune response has to respond well to get a protective immune system. It's not just enough to give the vaccine. Kill vaccines, um, there's usually a large amount of, of virus in those kill vaccines because the vaccine's dead and it's, it's not going to replicate. You usually need two shots, two, two injections, two or three or four weeks apart depending on the individual vaccine. They're very safe, but you tend to get shorter immunity versus the versus the uh, live vaccine. What, what do you do here? Okay. Um, modified live vaccines are actually vaccine viruses that replicate in the animal. In other words, you give that virus vaccine, the, vac the vaccine virus is alive, it replicates in the animal without causing disease, so it spreads all over the animal's body, not just at the site of injection. It replicates the animal response to it, and uh, you have to mix it up beforehand. Uh, there's sterile uh, diluent and the and the virus cake, and they get a, a little bit better protection, a little bit longer protection. Some of you in the audience are old enough to have been vaccinated with with, uh, and, and remember uh, being vaccinated for polio, poliomyelitis. How many of you had the Salk vaccine, the kill vaccine? First one came out. It was a miracle, wasn't it? And you had to give every every few years. You had to get a booster. Then they came out with a little vaccine on the sugar cube, the safe vaccine. That. that was really a miracle. Because once once you're vaccinated, you basically you're protected a lot. Except now that a lot of us are living long enough, maybe we should be revaccinated. Uh, we we don't want to get it uh, ever. Um, factors that affect the immune response. Dr. Hoare talked about BVD virus in the herd. These are these persistently infected animals that can be born into any herd. They get the virus uh, early in gestation. They don't uh, mount an immune response to it, and they are virus factories. And they get into your herd, and they just shed virus, billions of virus particles, 
uh, per ml of anything they put out. Tears, feces, urine, the virus is in there. If you've got BBD virus in your, in your herd, that's a problem. If the animals are stressed, if you decide to vaccinate on the afternoon, that's 107 degrees. That's stress. That's stress. They won't respond as well to that vaccine. And you could cook your vaccine, by the way, too, on a day like then. So stress is important. You know, if they've had a, if this is a booster, they're going to get a be much better response than if they've never seen that, that particular antigen before. Once again, the products that are used, the way you store it and mix it, whether or not they're parasitized. Parasitized animals, immune response is blunted. It is not as good as, uh, as it would be otherwise. And then uh, trace minerals, you know, particularly in this country where we've got selenium and copper deficiencies, uh, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, storage of our vaccines. I'm just passing out a little uh, thing from Progressive Producer, and it's about the way we store our vaccines on our ranches. These are surveys that have been done. And you can take a look at those pictures and see if any of those refrigerators look like your refrigerators where you store your vaccines. But vaccines should be stored, most of them should be stored between 35 and 45 degrees of temperature. What's the best temperature to store your, your Budweiser after you've been? It's 32, isn't it? Just about 32? Yeah. It's a little bit too cold for vaccines. So if it's a great refrigerator for your beer, it may not be a great refrigerator for your vaccine. You want to keep them above 35 and below 45. And below 35 is much worse on a vaccine particularly the viral vaccines, than above 45. It really hammers the vaccines. And if you're in North Dakota in the summertime, where, where, do, where do vaccine re refrigerators come from? I mean, do, do you go down to Costco and buy a new refrigerator for your vaccine? No. Where do they come from? So one that's not working in the house, isn't it? So it's not quite working so well, let's take it out to the shop or let's take it out to the corral area and we'll put our vaccines out there. And sometimes the reason it's not working well, it's not very well insulated. So in the summertime it gets too hot. And in the wintertime it gets too cold. You know, particularly if you're in North Dakota or Modoc County or something like that. So we, we, we don't do a very good job of storing our vaccines. And it turns out in a number of surveys that have been, in, been done in Nevada, we're going to talk about the Nevada one uh, in Kentucky, in uh, Arkansas, in Tennessee, in Idaho. It turns out about a third, about 30% of our, of our storage refrigerators we use for our vaccines on our farms and ranches, about 30% of them are at the right temperature. How many, are you, how many got 30%? How many, how many are in that 30% deal? Yeah, there's one. There's one now. Uh, and so that, that creates a heck of a problem. We go to, and these vaccine prices, have you noticed they're going up? They're kind of like oil. The price of the vaccine just keeps going up all the time. And so we need to make sure that we're storing them appropriately. Uh, those conditions are on the vaccine label. You can read those. And it, it's from the management or the, it's from the manufacturer until the time you use them shoot side that's important. The manufacturers have got to the point where they actually send a temperature sensing device in the, in the vaccines to their distributors. So they know they're getting from their factory to the distributors. It's from the distributors to the cow that things start breaking down. And we want to make sure we're not part of that breakdown. Uh, Mail order vaccines, uh, you know, if it sits out in your mailbox for three days before you happen to pick it up, may not be too good. So you have to be careful about that. No use to, no use to save 10% by mail order and have a bad vaccine. So temperature, too hot, certainly the proteins in the vaccine will break down, lower immune response, and then really freezing uh, really decreases their effectiveness quite a bit. And that's, is that it or okay? Um, many of our vaccines have what we call adjuvants. So they have a, uh, the vaccine antigens or proteins are suspended in a material that increases the immune response. Well, when we get them frozen, particularly freezing, those adjuvants will separate from the proteins. So even though we didn't totally inactivate the vaccine, it's not working near as well 
as it would have if that adjuvant was, uh, was appropriately handled. So I mentioned uh, about 30% of, well, the, the UNR study showed 75% were working pretty good. Uh, the other study showed about 30% were working pretty good. Uh, their cast off refrigerators, the, you, you know, inside the refrigerator can make a big difference, whether it's right up next to the freezing coils or, or away from them a little ways. Uh, so, and, and it can be warm or cold if the seal at the door leaks and then the insulation is not thick enough for outside. So, you know, you can buy these recording thermometers, these really simple ones that are just a U-shaped thermometer that's got a high and low magnet on them. Put them in your refrigerator, put them at separate spots around the refrigerator, and measure it for a few days. And if it's not working right, do something before you put a whole lot of vaccine. At the, at the least, take all your beer from inside the house and put it out in the fridge and keep your vaccines in, inside where your, your refrigerator is actually working. Uh, put it in different locations. Make sure you don't have cold spots or hot spots. They cost less than 20 bucks. You can get the electronic or the magnets. And then leave it in the refrigerator for, you know, several days uh, and maybe a couple of times a year to make sure whether you we're talking about uh, cold or, or warm. Parasites, of course, uh, they, they tend to uh, evade the host defenses by blunting the immune response. And so um, if they're heavily parasitized or moderately parasitized, parasitized the immune response is not going to work very well. There's both porons and injectables. We're finding that the injectables tend to do a little bit better job than the porons, although the porons are more convenient. No question about that. And so your vaccination program has to kind of be in sync with your para parasite control program. So that's important to think about that part too. And then. Uh, if, they're, if the calves are nutritionally deficient or the cows are nutritionally deficient, it doesn't matter whether it's protein or energy or some of these trace minerals, they're not gonna, their immune system just doesn't work as well. And so it's important for you to, to think about that. Uh, we've got two of them in California that cause us a lot of problems, uh, selenium and copper. And they're very important in the immune system, so you need to make sure your normal shape as far as that's concerned. We've done a lot of work here at Sierra Field Station uh, on, on minerals over the years. And one of the things we found, a couple of, a couple of items we found, is if the mom's okay, the calf is born okay. But most of these trace minerals are not well transferred through the milk. So out when the calf gets about three to five months of age, they start to run out. And in fact, sometimes they'll run out to the point where they stop growing very much. You know, they'll go from two pounds or uh, two pounds plus per day of gain to maybe 1.25 or one or something like that. So it's not only affecting their growth, it affects their immune system too. So make sure these, these calves are, are in good shape. And um, the, um, the calves don't do very well on trace mineral salt mixes. Uh, sometimes it takes them several months to really get onto it. So if someone will get on, on it at day one and start eating it and consuming it like the moms do, but sometimes the calves are very slow to get on it. It may take them six months before they, before they really consume that the way they need to. Um, they're kind of like kids, kids and vitamin pills, you know. It takes, takes a while to get them going. Uh, they're not, neither selenium or copper well transferred through the milk, and we talked talk about that. It's really easy to diagnose nowadays. I remember when I got in, uh, when I graduated from vet school, getting a diagnosis of a trace mineral deficiency was like rocket science and logistics were unbelievable. Nowadays it's simple. Your veterinarian can take a blood sample or a serum sample and you can find out what you're short of, what you're, what you're adequate in, and maybe even over supplementing sometimes. You can find that out. So that's really important to, uh, to do that. And then um, selenium, we know what's deficient. Uh, in Yuba County, uh, with 340 samples we've taken over, over time, uh, they average about 0 .03, which is really quite deficient. That's not good. Uh, and then normal would be this. Uh, so Yuba County is obviously deficient in selenium. Uh, Butte County, about the same average. Uh, just taking taking herds, and uh, you know, 
That's that's the fish area. And then Placer County is about the same. So you, you're probably sitting on top of a selenium deficiency if you aren't supplementing well. And if you are supplementing, it's probably a good idea to take a few samples and find out how well you're doing. And that was Nevada County. And Nevada County, I think, was just, just about, well, they're doing a little bit better on a, on a smaller number of herds. Copper, uh, Yuba County in, in 25 samples was, you know, right, right on the margin of being normal. Uh, Butte County was everywhere from pretty deficient to probably okay. And, uh, oops, and Placer County. Uh, most of those look pretty good with some liver samples that, that looked quite good. So, depending on where you're at, what your herd uh, situation is, what you feed them, how you supplement, that may be an important thing to consider. And Nevada County looked pretty good as far as copper was concerned, uh, and that part's good. So, now you're ready to vaccinate. You got your animals dewormed, you got your minerals right, you, 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 you figured out where it's all gonna fit in your cycle, and you know how to take care of your vaccines. So now you're ready to do something. Uh, and I would encourage you to think about it that way. You know, the vaccination part of it is the last thing you do. Getting ready is the first thing you do. Doing all those things to make your strategic decisions, make sure your animals aren't parasitized, make sure you're not short on one of these nutrients that's so important, and, and you handle your vaccines in an appropriate manner. Okay, I'm going to quit. Question, question. Oh, question. got a question. Anybody, reckon, anybody recognize their refrigerator in that article I passed around? <laughs> Tell them about the, the uh, block trace mineral program. Oh, the, the trace, the 50 pound uh, press blocks. We've done some research on that, and you know, the 50 pound press salt block that you put out in the pasture. The trace minerals in that block will go through the block faster than the cattle can keep up with them. A heavy dew, a light rain, saliva from the cows licking on it will actually make those minerals, which have a different solubility than sodium chloride or salt, will make those minerals go through that block and move away from the cattle faster than they can keep up with them. So if you're going to use salt mineral mixes, use the loose salt mineral mix, not the block. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah, if you keep the block out of the weather, it will move through less rapidly. But remember, those salt blocks are saturated with water at about 2% of their weight, which is a pint of water. Those cows, when they're licking on that block, they'll put a pint of water in that salt block pretty fast. And just salt's very hygroscopic. So if it's foggy or something like that and the fog goes through, it'll saturate that block. And, and the minerals will start moving down through that block. Think of that block as a, as a big high-rise, and the sodium chloride or salt are the steel girders in the high-rise, and the trace minerals that are in there are in between those steel girders, and they just move down through that column really very easily. Do you have a question? I was just wondering if there's any study or thoughts on using salt granules, like salt granules. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're. You're talking about the uh, the water softener salt yeah, uh, with the round. Salt. No, the round uh, crystal. This is just crushed. Just the the bigger the yeah, bigger. Salt. Yeah, the crystals uh, of salt. You know, they're and, and those are those are manufactured in like the Great Salt Lake or down here in the Bay Area or something like that. And those are, uh, that's the way it, it's mined. So it's, 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 it's not processed very much. Uh, with that, you, you need to have it a little bit smaller particle size to mix the trace minerals in with it and get good dispersion. Uh, but you and I could talk, maybe we could come up with a new product where we could put those minerals in the into those little crystals, that would be a pretty good idea. I like that idea. I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but that's a good idea. Uh, 
Good, good question. Dr. Wilson brings up the question of, you know, once you once you've stored it prop, properly, then how do you handle out by the chute? And that's a big part of the BQA, the Beef Quality Assurance Program, is is the vaccines. Uh, you don't want to get them in direct sunlight. You want to keep them cool. Now, if you vaccinate, you want to have ice packs. If you're vaccinating the winter you know, and it's 25 degrees out there, then you want to keep them in something that will keep them a little bit warmer than ambient temperature. So you don't want to get them too hot, don't want to get them in direct sunlight. Uh, the modified live virus vaccine should have their own guns because you don't want to use any disinfectants on those guns, alcohol or soap or anything like that, Novasan, because you will inactivate that modified live virus vaccine in that, in that vaccine gun. So you want, to be, you want to handle those kinds of things separately. And we go through that uh, information in great detail in the BQA program. So if you haven't been through one in a while, that's a good idea. But handling the vaccines is really important.